all of you this morning and uh, I, I don't know if you can tell physically that it's we've been going from almost 70 to 30s but my throat can't and so uh, I needed some extra liquid for this morning thank you for your patience we are wrapping up today our uh, series God with us and uh, this is the last Sunday before before Christmas begins, uh, last Sunday of Advent, Christmas begins on Christmas Day and then goes for those, those notoriously 12 days of Christmas and the Christmas season. And uh, so uh, I encourage you to be back with us next week as we celebrate Christmas. Next Sunday is actually Christmas Sunday. It's the Sunday of the season of Christmas. So I, I, uh, I uh, look forward to that, to celebrating, celebrating Christmas as we have been celebrating Advent. Uh, uh, I want to jump right in this week. This is a scripture we've been reading, but I want to read the scriptures before it because it really tells the Christmas story. Is it, I guess it's appropriate today of all days to read the Christmas story. We do that. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. This is Matthew's account. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph, but before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of of the Holy Spirit. Now I know when you read that, some of you, um, it it uh, it worries you uh, to see the Holy Spirit. Don't let that worry you. Don't. This was just Mary. That's not one of the things that happens generally when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Just want to, for the record, I don't want you to jump to conclusions. This was just Mary. I read that. I was reading that this week, and it said she became. Pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm like, man, I'm glad we don't include that in some of the things we expect. Joseph, verse 19, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, this version of Matthew, uh, of the Christmas story of Matthew, we see this picture and type and this description. I, 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 I made a completely appropriate joke of, about the power of the Holy Spirit conceiving Jesus in the womb of Mary. And I, 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 but that description in Matthew is actually a description of one of the, the key, our cornerstone sort of tenets of our faith. And that is not only the virgin birth, but the incarnation. The incarnation. Um, here is what, if you looked up that definition from a, from a theo theological perspective, like in a book or online somewhere, this is what it would say. In Christian theology, the doctrine of the incarnation holds that Jesus, the pre-existent divine logos word, and the second hypostasis of the Trinity, God the Son and Son of the Father, taking on human body and human nature, was made flesh, conceived in the womb of Mary, the Theotokos, or God-bearer. The doctrine of the incarnation, then, entails that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully human, his two natures joined in hypostatic union. Amen. I think we can just go home now. I think that's... Oh, yeah. That's a... That's a... 
I had to read it several times to, to get the idea. But here's that doctrine we get. Can, can I read something that's a lot more simplified for you? John 1 and 14. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. The word became flesh and lived among us. That, that is the essence of the incarnation. Now it's important, listen, I don't want to mock and make fun of theology. You, you've heard Victor and I both advocate many times in this term that without theology we're doomed. We need good theology, good doctrine. That's good. That's not boring, old, nasty stuff. That's good stuff. It, it helps reinforce those goosebumps we have because goosebumps are misleading. You know, when I run around doing stuff and, 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 and perspiration starts breaking and you can see all of mine and, and Jeff's and other people's, I don't mention, but you can see it. And I have people stop me all the time and they'll say, are you okay? Are you, so, when I was in West Africa, those poor people thought I was dying. They just, they didn't even have air in their house. And it was, was but all I did was set for a whole afternoon. I preached the first time I went, I preached that morning and my flight left that night. And so I was just hanging out at the pastor's house and he had stuff to do. He had people he was canceled, counseling. He had me to meet with all the local pastors in that area. We just sat in his house. He had a little fan he put on me that barely worked. And his poor wife kept coming to me. He said, are you okay? Are you okay? But it's only even shake. Oh, you okay? Because I was just, because I can't, my sweat doesn't hide under here. It just runs all down. She gave me a washcloth and I rang it out like three different times. I mean, it was just like, it was a long afternoon. So some of you see that, and, and, and when, when, I, when I get like that, and then I finally get still, and I can feel the air circulation, and that little bit of a breeze kind of hits the top of my head, I get goosebumps. It's not the Holy Spirit. It's not <laughs> things like, I, you know, and doctrine, good theology helps us to separate those experiential moments, those incredible powerful moments, we'll talk about a little bit, that are important, but without understanding that God was fully human and God was fully man. And that, that, that he was that. Now, we've talked about God with us for the last three weeks. And each week has dealt with, really, with a different place where we find God, where God is with us. We've talked about God being with us in the valley, God being with us in the wilderness, God being with us in the storm. Today, I want to shift location and, and talk about, uh, instead of a place, talk about an element of time. I want us to look at the scriptures today, and, and I'll remind ourselves that he is Emmanuel, he is God with us, and he is God with us always. Always. See, if we're not careful, we can see Christmas story as only historical. Something that happened a long time ago in a faraway place, in a, in a, in a um, universe long far away. That's, our, that's Star Wars. In a, long, a place long ago where we celebrate it once a year and we celebrate and remember it. But the truth is, he did become flesh. He lived on the earth and he was called Emmanuel. But God has always been. He's always been and always will be. John, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 4, talks about these four living creatures. And this is what he says about them in verse 8, the second part of verse 8. Day after day and night after night, they keep on saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, the one who is, and who is still to come. John, in John's gospel, when he starts telling us about it, John, you know, tells us he became flesh. John gives us the Christmas story from a theological perspective. And he starts his book this way. In the beginning, the word was God. The word already existed. The word was with God. And the word was God. John starts by describing this both in the beginning of his gospel and in Revelation. He's describing the eternal nature of Jesus. He is eternal. He is eternal was, is, and is to come. The writer of Hebrews said this about Jesus in chapter 13, verse 8. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Now here, the writer gives us a, a picture and type into Jesus' characteristic of, of uh, immutability, which means he doesn't change, but he also puts it with the time factor of eternity. He says he was, is, and is to come. But he also was the same yesterday, today, and forever. That means he was and is and is to come and does not change. It is the same. He is always the same. Jesus said this about his presence before he left this earth. After he commissioned the disciples at the end of Matthew, uh, the end of the book of Matthew, chapter 28, the second part of verse 20, he's just given them the great commission. 
He's told them to go and make disciples and, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Make disciples of them, he says. And then the second part of verse 20, he says, and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Even to the end of the age. He says, I am with you always. He is with us always. His name is Emmanuel. He was, he is, he is to come. He does not change. He is God with us always. Always. If I were Stephen Furtick and just said that, you guys would all jumped up and applaud. But that's okay. I don't know. He's a little more fragile than I am. I don't need all that. Let's look this morning. Just three things. I want to, I, because I began to look at this this week and thought, okay, he's with us always. I know that. I've read these scriptures. I know his eternal nature. I know the fact that he doesn't change. I know that if he was God with us when he was born and made flesh, he has been God with us and he will be God with us. I know that's true. But how is he with us? Because it's one thing to say it. It's another thing to see how does that look? What does that look like? So I just want to look quickly at three things this morning that let us know how he is with us always. Here's the first thing. You can write this in your notes. God is with us always through his word. Through his word. He was the word, the Bible says. And in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. But his word that we have canonized, the words, the word of God, he is with us. So many times I think we sense the experience, and that's okay to experience God. But sometimes we forget that he spoke. And, and, and I, I want to include you when I say his word, both the written word and there are times when he speaks to the Holy Spirit. And, and I don't want to get ahead of myself because we'll talk about that in a minute, but, but there are times that those words are, are appropriate as well. I don't want to just include it, but, but so many times I feel like we look for a word when we have his word. His word is powerful. That same writer in Hebrews, right after he said that in chapter 3 about him being the same yesterday, today, and forever, in chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. The word of God is described here in a way that's not safe. It's not comforting. Now, it is all those things. There are times, there are times uh, that at night I can't sleep, and, and I, I, if I close my eyes, all I, all I hear is me. And I don't like me so much all the time. I, I don't, you know, I, I, I've never understood somebody says, I just need to get alone with my thoughts. <laughs> no, thank you. I don't want alone with my thoughts. I just don't, don't have any desire to be alone with my thoughts. I just, maybe this is now turned into a therapy session. Um, I know Mariah's making notes in her margins. Do not psychoanalyze me. Stop it. Nathan doesn't have to take notes. He will get in the car with you today and tell me everything I said and why it's wrong. Thank you, Bob Fisher. Um, <clears throat> that's one of Nathan's professors in psychology. Can I, can I tell you, there are times when I will, I will take my phone and one of the great things I love about you version, just about now, they've got it in almost every translation. They've got the audio, but you, you pull it up and just hit play. And I tell you, those times when I'm restless and I don't want to be alone with my thoughts, and I'll, I'll take my phone and I'll just go to Psalms and hit play. And I'll sit there and, and, I'll, and I'll think, if I'm awake by the time I hear Psalm 150, I'm, I'm giving up. <laughs> you know, most of the time I'm asleep before we get to Psalm 8. You know? but, but I'm just hearing that. Just hearing that, that, that reading of scripture, it is peaceful in this, but that's not what this verse pictures. A two-edged sword is not peaceful, but it's very useful. And it gets right to, uh, the, our, it exposes our innermost thoughts and our desires. Can I tell you, if we are gonna be, have God with us, and this, this is sort of a two-way street. And so when I say today, this is how God is with us, it's also how we are with God, because God's desire is to be with us. That's why he called himself Emmanuel. That's his desire, is to have relationship with us. But it is a two-way street. God is always going to be with us. But if we want to be with him, there's some things we need to do. And so what I find is, when I say he's with us through his word, he has given us his word. That's how he is with us. But it's also how we come to him. It's how we draw near to him. It's how we are with him. And here's the beautiful thing about his word. In Luke, in Luke, the first chapter, in the midst of this 
telling, or the angel's telling Mary about the, what's going to happen to her. And, and right before he tells her about Elizabeth, her cousin, who's having the John the Baptist, right before that, there's this verse right in the middle of it, in verse 37. And he says, for the word of God will never fail. The word of God will never fail. See, this is starting to look like what we talked about Jesus. He was, is, and is to come. The word of God it is powerful. It's like a two-edged sword that, that both comforts and exposes us. It's good for us. And it will never fail. It will never fail. He is with us always through his word. Here's the second way he's through us. He's with us. He's with us through his word. And he's with us through his spirit. Before Jesus left, he had this long conversation at the end of John. In the book of John, you see it starting around chapter 13, 14. And it goes all the way through chapter 17 and 18. And then starts into the sort of what we know as the Passion Week. But we, we see Jesus sitting down and having this multi-chapter conversation with his disciples. And throughout this conversation, he keeps coming back to something over and over again. Let's see if you can figure it out. In, in chapter 14, verse 16, he says, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate, who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit, who leads into all truth. Now, here's the thing. Let's stop for a second. John 14, 16 is where he says this. John 14, a few verses earlier, I think in verse 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He has identified himself as the truth and then says, I'm going to ask the Father. He'll send you another advocate or paraclete, counselor, comforter, the Holy Spirit, who will never leave you. And he says he is the Holy Spirit who leads where? To all truth. Who's the truth? Jesus. Well, let's, let's keep going down to verse 26, John chapter 14. But when the Father sends the advocate as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. Here he is again. I want to send you one who's going to be with you and is going to point back to me. Next chapter, same verse, verse 26, but in chapter 15. But I will send you the advocate, the spirit of truth. He will come to you from the Father and will testify all about me. Are you starting to see a theme here? Jesus is promising them over and over again. This is how I'm going to be with you. This is how I'm going to be with you always. It, it's always amazing to me that I read that verse out of Matthew 28, the end of the Great Commission. I mean, he's given the Great Commission, and shortly after that, he leaves the earth. He's getting ready to leave. I've always found it very ironic that Jesus looked at the disciples and said, I will be with you always, even to the end of the earth. <laughs> and they left them. You know, it's like, if you look at that in and of itself, it seems paradoxical. Like, wait a minute, Jesus, you just said you'd be with us, and then you left. That's why he had this conversation with them earlier. He's letting them know, I'm going to be with you always. It's going to be through, not only my word, but through the Holy Spirit. Listen to what he says about the Holy Spirit in Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Here's the thing. Jesus said, I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit. This is how I'm going to be with you. I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And in that way, because we are one, the Father and he and I, I'm going to leave you with, we're going to leave you with me. But it's going to be the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send another comforter. He, he said earlier, and you've heard me read this verse a lot, that he says, I have to go because it's going to be better for you that you have the Holy Spirit. Because he will actually be able to dwell in you and with you. And here's the thing. Every time he talks about the Holy Spirit in chapters 14 and 15, and even in 16 and places, he talks about very clearly the Holy Spirit is going to be with you to, be, to witness to about me. He's going to point you back to me. He's going to point people back to me. Then he looks at them in Acts 1 and 8 and says, You shall receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And what? You will be witnesses unto me. See, the Holy Spirit's job is to point people to Jesus. He wants you to be full of the Holy Spirit. Why? So you will point people to Jesus. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. He wants that in you. Jesus is saying it's going to be greater because I'm here on the earth physically. One man, but I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave you the Holy Spirit. You can all be full of the Holy Spirit. And look at the impact you can have because you will, will be full of the one who points people to me. He's with us always through his word. He's with us always through his spirit. And thirdly, he is with us always through his presence. Now, I know it's Christmas, and when I say that, some of you are thinking, presence. <laughs> we get presents. 
Presence from Jesus. Now this is presence, the, the other spelling, presence. Listen, I, I don't apologize for quoting this psalm all the time, but this psalm is so full of, full of who God is. Psalm 139, this is verses 7 through 10. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. Now you've heard me talk about this before. This is talking about the omnipresence of God. The word for presence here, the word that is, the Hebrew word that is translated presence is the Hebrew word pane. And it means to be in proximity of someone. Uh, specifically, it, it, the word can be translated face. And it doesn't mean so much, and I, I will discover this in a minute, it doesn't so much that you see God's face, but that you are in his proximity. In other words, his actual physical presence, like you're around him. David is describing his presence, being around him. He says, I can't get away from your, your presence, like the fact that you're there. You're there everywhere I go. Let, let's look to another place where we, we see this thought idea of that kind of proximity, but we, we see it the deeper side of God's presence. Exodus 33. 33 and 12. One day, Moses said to the Lord, now, now let me just give, give some context here. Exodus 33, we have, we, he's gotten the children of Israel to Mount Sinai. God has tried to give them the Ten Commandments. They didn't like it. He was too loud. He smoked too much. He stayed too long. And they, were, they said, we don't like this. It's too, God, it's too noisy. We don't like all this. Um, Moses, Pastor Moses, you go meet with God. We don't really want to experience God, but we want you to go meet with him and then tell us what he said. So Moses said, okay, Moses climbs the mountain. Um, in the meantime, they decide to have church, but make it look like they looked in Egypt, and because that's what they thought church was supposed to be. So they, they got all the gold that God had blessed them with for travel. Instead of using it for what's its purposes, they melted it down, made a calf, and they began to celebrate around this calf, not to worship a calf god or something. They were worshiping Joseph. They said, make, let us make an image of the God who led us out of Egypt. They, they didn't turn their back on God. They just reduced his image. They, they still worshipped God, but they did it in a way that was safe and comfortable. And didn't, didn't cut between the quick and the marrow. Didn't expose the intentions and nature of their heart. They just made them something they could rub for good luck, that they could approach without it shaking in fear of death. Made something safe. And that angered God so much. He looked at Moses. I love how Moses and God have this interaction. If you read a lot of the interaction of God, every time Moses, every time the people do something, Moses will say to God, your people. And then when you do something else, God will look at Moses and say, the people that you let out of Egypt. It's like two parents almost talking, like your kids. You know. I can't pick on any of Well, I know, Mary's the only one not up here. I keep getting Nathan sitting in the back. But I, I started to give an illustration. I'm not going to do that. Where I have said, uh, your son, <laughs> um, and that's not fair. I'm sure there's, I'm sure there's been times I've said your daughter. I can't remember any of them, but I'm sure there's been times. But they had this relationship back and forth like this, and so now they're done with that. God has been giving Moses the law, and here's where we pick up in verse 12 of chapter 33. One day, Moses said to the Lord, "You have been telling me." Take these people up to the promised land. But you haven't told me whom you will send with me. You have told me I know you by name and I look favorably on you. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more fully and continue to enjoy your favor. And remember that this nation is your very own people. The Lord replied, I will personally go with you, Moses, and I will give you rest. Everything will be fine for you. He says to him here, even though he doesn't use the, the Hebrew word pane, he's using that expression. He's saying, I will be physically, with, I'm going to be present with you. You're, my presence is going to go with you. Verse 15, then Moses said, if you don't personally go with us, don't make us leave this place. Matter of fact, some of the older translations actually translate presence. Moses says, if your presence doesn't go with us, we will not go up from here. In other words, yeah, God, that was a given. Thanks for the reassurance that your presence is going to be with us. But if your presence ain't going to be with us, we ain't going nowhere. How will anyone know, verse 16, that you look favorably on me, on me and on your people, if you don't go with us? 
For your presence among us sets your people and me apart from all other people on the earth. The Lord replied to Moses, I will indeed do what you have asked, for I look favorably on you, and I know you by name. Moses responded, then show me your glorious presence. Show me, and he uses a different word here. He doesn't say, show me your proximity. He says, show me your kabod. That word mostly, that we leave the word presence off of the Bible, tells me you see it translated glory. Show me your glory. Really, it's describing a presence that is, the, the first word, when you look at the definition of this word, is heaviness. Not in a sense of grief. Heaviness as if I cannot even stand. I feel God's presence presence, his glory. And Moses says, yes, we, we have your proximity. We need your glory. We need the weightiness of who you are. We need to experience, it. this is a word that gets used a lot to describe this. There is the presence of God, and then there's the manifest presence of God. That's when the very presence of God is manifest among us. When we're in here and we're lifting up his name and we're worshiping, and you begin to just feel that, that, that uh, and it feels a lot of different ways for me sometimes. It's, just, it's a feeling of faith, like I could pray for anything in this moment and I know God would answer me. Sometimes it's a feeling of I just can't help but rejoice. Sometimes I have to just lift my voice and say something. I have to respond in some way. This is the presence of God, the glorious presence, the kabod of God. Here's another place that's mentioned. In, in, in Exodus, a few chapters later, now God has given Moses all the instructions and, God, and Moses has finally finished building the tabernacle that God set up. And he said, this is a shadow and type of things above. I want you to build something where I can dwell. And he built this tabernacle, all exacting the way it was done, the right colors, the right fabrics, all this stuff. Builds this, this mobile church. Verse 34, verse chapter 40. Then, this is when it was all completed, the cloud covered the tabernacle. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down on it, over it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God said, I'm going to dwell here. I'm going to reside here. The weightiness, the kabod of who I am is going to settle here. We see if you can read, you, you, you start looking for that word in the Old Testament. It's all through the Old Testament. In a lot of places, it'll say this. There's some, there's some not so great verses. There's some verses where God pronounced Ichabod because he said the glory that Kavod had left. They lost the ark. It was gone. His glory dwelt in that ark. And we see that happening over and over again. And, and God's glory, his, his Kavod, the manifest presence of God, dwelt in the, in the ark of the covenant, in the tabernacle. It, it was moved to the, at one point for a brief period, the tabernacle of David. Then, then when the temple was complete, it was in the temple, the presence of God. And the thing, the sad thing a little bit about the Old Testament is God uh, could only trust certain people with his presence. And so you had to be part of the the lineage of Aaron and the high priest to even experience the very presence of God, to go back into the Holy of Holies, to step into that place. If you were just the regular folk, all you could do is bring a sacrifice and let the, let the high priest go and seek atonement for you on your behalf. Go and visit the presence of God, the very weightiness of his presence. But then something happens. Something happens in, in, in the New Testament. Because the New Testament equivalent, the Greek, you know, Old Testament's Hebrew, New Testament Greek. And the Greek word, the closest equivalence to the word kabod, is the word doxa. Doxa, it's where we get our word for doxology. It really can be said it's the study of his glory or, his, or the praise of God. What, some of you are looking like, huh? Because Here's the doxology. Some of you have heard it, didn't know you ever heard it. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Pray, praise him above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I think there was something else in there. not. I go straight to that. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I'm kind of a little sad that Lucille's not here with us today because she'd probably start singing it right now. Just on her own, she would, and I'd let her. Uh, listen, and because and, she loves a lot of different songs, but that's one of them she loves. And I love to hear her sing it. And it's, it's that whole song is it's about the, the glory of God. It's the equivalent of the kabod in the Old Testament. 
You know where that word gets seen first a lot in, in the Gospels? In John's Gospel, we, we actually read it a minute ago. So the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his doxa. We have seen the glory of God. The glory of the Father's one and only Son. And I tell you, we had glory and it resided in the tabernacle, the tabernacle of David, in the temple. And now it resides in Jesus. And when Jesus came and he lived on this earth, and then he laid down his life and died. And he died for us. And something powerful happened when he paid that ultimate price. The veil that allowed only that high priest to enter in the Holy of Holies and witness the kapod of God, that veil was rent from top to bottom. And God gave us access once again to the glory of God. He gave it to us. It was here in Jesus. Jesus said, I'm going to leave it for you. And what? The Holy Spirit. Now the Holy Spirit, he says, I have to go so the Holy Spirit can come. And then we see Paul saying things in 1 Corinthians like this. In verse, I don't have it on the screen, but in verse 16, I think of chapter 3. He says, you make up, don't you know that you make up the temple of the Holy Spirit? It's one of the reasons we gather. It's one of the reasons we gather together. Because we make up a container, a place, a habitation for God to dwell through the power of the Holy Spirit. But then in chapter six, and he's talking about sexual sins here, but he's talking about the fact that your body doesn't belong to you. And the reason you need to keep it clean and pure and holy and away from sexual impurity, he says, the reason is, don't you know, he says in verse 19 of chapter six, don't you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? You are temples that come together and make a larger temple. I, I know you said that, you said that before, Pastor. I'm going to keep saying. So we kind of glimpse and grasp that idea that our bodies are made to be containers of the very glory of God. Amen. The very nature. We are containers of his glory. And we aren't containers just to sit at home and glow. I think we think that sometimes. Or, or maybe not to sit around and glow. We're containers of his glory so we can do some laps. Right? Some of you don't even know what that means. So we can shout. I've seen Victor almost do it once or twice. I've seen him do it right in here. His knees won't let him do it on the outside, but I've seen him do it in here a couple times. And he talks about the old days at Meadowwood when he used to run, and I wish I could have seen that. I wish I had video of that. It would show up at every Christmas party with some kind of different track underneath it, I guarantee you. <laughs> Can I tell you, the next place we see that word, from the time that that, that prophetic word that John gives us, Luke 2, 13. And suddenly... There was with the angel. This is when the angels appeared to shepherds on the side of a the field. There was an angel. He was with the angel, a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Doxa to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Can I tell you, there is a connection between the glory of God and peace and goodwill on earth. Can I tell you where there's not a connection in the scriptures? If we just had the right government, we'd have peace and goodwill on the earth. That's not in there. It doesn't say that. Now, please understand, you've heard me say this, and I'll say it again. Be a responsible citizen. Vote your conscience. Vote scripturally. Vote. Be a part of this country. This is where we belong. If you're a citizen of this country, do your part. But if your hope resides in this country, then you've got hope in the wrong thing. Because the angels didn't say, oh, Herod, we need a better Herod. And then we'll have peace and goodwill on the earth. If we could just get Caesar saved, we'd have peace and goodwill on the earth. And that wouldn't have made sense then because Jesus was still baby. But they didn't say that. They said glory. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace, goodwill towards all men. There is a connection between glory. Said, okay, well, how do we get from glory? Do we need angels to appear every day? That's what we need. We need angels to appear every day and pronounce the glory. We, we kind of think that. You say we don't, but we sing that. We say it. We talk about it all the time. We say, let the glory. Oh, we just want the glory to fall. We want that, like, glory has to somehow come. Can I tell you, can you give you a little wonderful Christmas present here? Glory came. He came. He became flesh. And he dwelt among us. And he left us his Holy Spirit. We don't have to wait for glory to fall. Glory fell. Acts chapter 2. Go read about it. The Holy Spirit came. And he's still here. He hadn't left. 
and he's with us. And if we will stay in his word, and if we will stay in, in, in the very presence of God and stay full of the Holy Spirit. Listen to what the psalmist said about his glory. He said, praise his glorious name. Psalm 72, 19. Praise his glorious name forever. Let the whole earth be filled with his kabod, his glory. Let the whole earth be filled. How does the earth get filled with his glory? Do we need to pray for angel showers? Do we need to pray for Holy Ghost showers? For stuff to fall down? How is the earth filled with his glory? Psalm 85, 9 talks about it being filled with his glory. He says, surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. So our land will be filled with his glory. His salvation is near to you. Why? So the earth will be filled with his glory. Because when you accept Christ and you decide to follow him and you are filled with his Holy Spirit, then you seek and ask him to baptize you, to overflow you with the empowerment of his Holy Spirit so that you can be witnesses unto him. Then you continue to make disciples who are then filled with his glory. And they make disciples who are filled with his I feel like I'm doing a Miss Brett commercial. And they will find too, and they will find too, and they will find. Everybody makes disciples. And you know what happens eventually? The whole earth is filled with his glory. The very glory. You are a container of God. You are a container, a temple of the Holy Spirit. He wants you to be full of the Holy Spirit. He wants you to stay in his word, listening to his word, following his word. Stay full of the Holy Spirit. Stay in his presence, experiencing the very kabod of glory. Here's the beautiful thing of what Paul talks about. And he doesn't point this out, but the fact that he calls us all temples of the Holy Spirit. And then he says, when you get together, you form the temple of the Holy Spirit. You can experience the kabod, the weightiness, the doxa of God's presence when we come together and when you're by yourself because you are a temple and we make the temple. He wants us to be both. We need both. We need to stay full of his Holy Spirit. He is with us always. He wants us to be with him as much as he wants to be God with us. He wants us to be full of his word. He wants us to be full of his Holy Spirit. He wants us to be full of his glorious presence so that we in turn We'll make disciples who stay full of his word, full of his spirit, full of his presence, who become disciples, who make disciples. We have a great task. We have a great calling, a great commission. I don't think it's any accident that Jesus gave the great commission and then said, I will be with you. Remember how? I'll be with you. It's not on you. You can't read enough books. Victor will tell you that. It's not, you can't read enough books. Well, he won't tell you that. I, I, I wish I read as many books as victories. You can't read enough books. You can't argue with people and convince them to be a follower of Christ. You can't do it. I mean, it's fine to have an answer. Paul says have an answer. He says be ready. You know, be able to talk about your faith. Do that. Now, I'm, I'm going to, he's going to hate this because he don't like what I talk about in the messages. This morning, Nathan showed me, a, looked like Nathan's been working at Domino's. Um, for the last couple of weeks. And uh, he does some slave work in the morning for a local taskmaster, and then he goes and works at Domino's at night. Um, I, actually, to be honest with you, Nick told me what he does for Jeff, and I'm, I'm available anytime you need to help. I'm glad. Uh, I noticed he didn't go ask her if he needed help. Right, just a second. I don't know. I'm just kidding. He also knew Lucas was back in town, and that was probably a given. But Nathan has only been there a couple of weeks, and he hadn't worked every day. He's there maybe, maybe three times a week, four times a week, maybe for just the last couple of weeks. Yeah, last night, when he was leaving, one of the managers handed him something and said, Hey, uh, I, uh, you got here right after we drew names for the Secret Santa, so you didn't get in on all that. But since you missed out, I saw this, and I thought of you. And she handed him this little pewter looking plate that said, give us this day, our daily bread. And I looked at him and I said, Nate, why did she think you would like that? Does she know you're a Christian? He said, well, yeah. We're containers of his glory. We are called to carry his glory into this earth, to make disciples, to be full of his word. God is with us. He needs to be with everybody. Amen. And that happens through us. Will you bow your heads with me, Father? We thank you that your son came. 
Lord, I thank you that he came and became flesh and dwelt among us. That he laid down his life, that he died. That he rose again on the third day. That he sits at the Father's right hand, praying and interceding for us. I thank you that we, we, we don't have a high priest like other high priests. We have a high priest who has passed through and conquered the heavens. Who was tempted in every way we were, but yet without sin. Who experienced everything we experienced and yet did not sin. Who knows what it's like. Who knows what we've experienced. Who is praying for us. Father, I pray for those today here in this house and those that are hearing this either live or, or will listen to it later that need to follow you, that need to make that confession of faith, to make a choice, to make a decision. I pray that you'll give them the courage to pray those words. Father, forgive me. Cleanse my heart. I repent. I change direction. I want to follow after you. I believe in my heart and I know that you came, that you died for me, that you rose again. Lord, those of us that believe that, we thank you, God, that you have made us the promise through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have you with us. We have you in, in your word. We have you in the spirit. And we have you, your presence. Help us today to be open receptacles of your presence, of your glory. That we may take you out into the earth. That we may make disciples. Help us to be aware of those around us. God, if we were ever put on trial at our jobs or in our, our families or in our communities, if we were ever put on trial for being a follower of Christ, let them find enough evidence to prove us guilty. Lord, help us today to be containers of your glory through the power of the Holy Spirit. I pray those of the, today that have not had that experience with you to be baptized, fill me today with today. Just reach out and ask of you and say, Father, fill me. Yes. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Yes. Lord, I pray today, keep me full of your Holy Spirit. Yes. Fill me again. Yes. Fill me anew. Keep me overflowing with the power of your Holy Spirit to be witnesses of you so that I might point people to you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the fellowship and the communion that we have with one another and with you, Emmanuel. Wow. I've got about five sermons I want to preach right now. <laughs> I mean, that was, thank you, Pastor Paul. That message was just, it was just full of, of good things. We encourage you to respond to the message you've heard. Uh, if you would, to fill out your connection cards. Because as much information you're comfortable with, on the back of that are some action steps you can take this week, a scripture you can memorize. Respond with your tithes, with your offerings. Let me remind you, we are uh, still doing our special Advent project, raising money for Bible for North Korea. Uh, next Sunday will be the last Sunday for that. So if you're planning on giving, you need to be sure to make plans for that. Let me, let me just mention how important that is. Uh, <clears throat> North Korea is technically a communist government, uh, and it is. Uh, but it's a very distinct form of communism that is uh, basically a personality cult. Uh, it focuses on, on the dictator, currently Kim Jong-un, who is considered a god. They tell stories about how he will fly into an airport and it's raining, and when the door opens and he steps off the plane, the clouds disperse and the sun comes out. Uh, he's calling down thunder and lightning on his enemies and and he, he's literally worshipped as a god. And they have a, a philosophy in North Korea, it's called Juche, uh, which basically means self-reliance. They're totally independent, they don't need anybody or anything else. And they don't know how much they need the gospel, how much they need Jesus. And the word of God provides that. So let me encourage you again, for just four dollars, I will send a Bible to North Korea in their particular Korean dialect. And because they're matching funds, every $4 you give provides two Bibles. So think and pray about that this week and, and next week. As we come to the part of the service where we participate in the Lord's table, um, I was thinking, and I always think and pray about you know, what to share here. And, and Paul's message was so full of uh, many, many good things that I, I've had to, pick and choose that I wanted to share. 
But one thought sort of really stood out. Looking at the scripture, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That phrase, the Word was with God, is very interesting in the Greek. In Greek, it's, and you don't need to know this, but just to let you know, in Greek it's prostotheo. It literally means, it's translated usually with, but that word pros literally means toward. The word was toward the Father. Eternally, everlastingly, the Son was turned toward his Father. Using the terminology Paul talked about today, he was face to face with his Father eternally. In adoration, in love, in service, he was eternally facing his Father. And then when you couple that with verse 14, and the Word became flesh, what he's basically saying is, I was ever eternally present face to face with my Father, and I chose to come face to face with you and have bring my presence here, the kabod of God, the glory of God, the presence, the very face of God to be with you forever. And when we take communion, we remember that he did that, becoming literal flesh and blood with us, for us, eternally. And this reminds us he is Emmanuel. He is God with us. He took on human form. We celebrate that at Christmas so that he could be with us eternally. So we encourage you now to join with us in the communion service. We remember that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You take of the bread. And then he took out the cup. He said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All of you drink of it. Do this and remember. Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. The body and the blood given for us. Emmanuel, the word made flesh, become flesh for our redemption. And he is eternally Emmanuel. He is always ever present with us. Father, we are so thankful for that. God, as we go forth from this place today, let us carry the kabod of God, the very glory and presence of God with us to a world that needs your love, your grace, needs to see your glory. Thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for this word you've given us to our pastor today, planting our hearts, Father. And may God, during this Christmas week, this upcoming Christmas season, God, may this word in encourage us and inspire us, Father, to be thankful, to be grateful for what Jesus has done for us, and then to be lights ourselves and salt in this world that needs to hear the gospel. And Father, to help us do this, we pray our benediction together. Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Go with the Lord this week. Have a very Merry Christmas. God bless you.